Today's F we're going to be learning is Bava Messiah Daf Hef. We're going to get started at the bottom of Yud Tet Amabet. Tanu Rabanan, Matzah Shoval. So now we have receipts. So we're going to start with receipts today and end with receipts. So we have a receipt. It basically says, normally, okay, we have a loan. Somebody owes money to somebody else. Let's just go through some basics that will stand as the basis for a bunch of things we're going to learn today. When you take out a loan, remember the love, the borrower, is responsible to write out the document, right? They go to the software, get the document written out because they're going to borrow the money. And then after it's written, they give it to the malve. Okay, they give it to the person who lent them the money. The malve keeps it the whole time they owe the money, that they're owed money. Once the person pays it back, a few things can happen, okay? They normally would try to rip up the, the sharko so that there's proof that, you know, no one tries to collect it again, the document's ripped. They also often wrote a receipt of payment. And then whose responsibility is it to write the receipt? The Malva's responsibility is to write the receipt. And then the creditor, because right, they want to get their money back. So they say, oh, I'll write the receipt. Here's the receipt, because the, the borrower wants to know that there's proof that they paid. Here's the receipt. They give it to the Lova, and it's with the Lova. So now we're going to talk about a case where we have a husband and wife. So it's not a borrower and a lender. But it's a husband commits to the wife to pay the wife a certain amount of money. So the husband's like the borrower and the woman is like the lender because in the end, she's owed money. So if you find the cheval on the street and you don't know, did it come from him or her? Now, if it came from him, it's because he wrote it, but he hadn't yet given her the money. And if it's her, then it means he already paid the money and it's hers. Right. Sorry. If she admits that she got paid the money and then really... I hope I didn't say it the reverse way. The husband, I, I think I might've just messed it up. Sorry. The wife, I just confused the husband and the wife. Let me go back. The wife gets the shovar written that she's paid her money, got her money paid, and then gives it to the husband and the husband keeps the document for safekeeping. Sorry that I just confused those and got you more confused. But so now if she says, oh yeah, this was found on the street. You don't know who to give it to. Well, I'll admit that my husband actually paid me. And really, the Shabbat should be his as proof of payment for, that he paid me. So then, Yachzir Labal. <clears throat> if the woman doesn't admit, though, then, because perhaps she had it written, but never actually got her money. But now we want to go to the first line. We're done with the bright, we're just requoting that first line. So now it says in the Brighta, you do return it to the husband if she admits. But back to our concern of people doing monkey business here. Well, maybe she had the shavar written up in Nissan because she thought he was going to pay her or was hoping he was going to pay her. But he didn't pay her in Nissan. Now she pulls out the shachov that says Nissan. Now why does that matter? Well, you might remember that we learned that a woman could sell her ketuba. So, she sold her, it's a promissory note in the end. So she sold it as a promissory note, right? For less money than it's worth, but for the, because remember, she might get the money, she might not get the money and all sorts of issues. She could have been divorced already, by the way, just not getting her ketuba, not received her ketuba money yet, and then basically sold it. Or her husband could still be married to her and, you know, anything could happen. But either which way, she sold it like you would sell a promissory note. Umapiklaitna. So she sells it, let's say, in ER. And then if basically we find this shavar on the street and she claims, oh, yeah, my husband paid me back. Now, he might have paid her back, but he might have paid her back in Tishrei. And she pulls out this document. And if we return it to, to the husband, right, then the husband can go to, right, the husband then says, oh, Chuba was mine. Right, the Kshuba was paid, and it was paid from when? From Nissan. So now he'll go, or she'll go, it doesn't really matter who, but they both agree that this is valid, and we say it's valid. They can take it to the people that she sold the Kshuba to, and the man can get his money back. Okay, so Mapikle the Shover Diktib in Nissan. He'll put out the date, pull out the Shover that says Nissan. So just like all the other cases, they can claim, oh, yeah. I pay back in Nissan and she sold it in ER and can't do that because it wasn't even hers to sell because it was already paid back. So why aren't we worried about this possibility? We're going to have three answers. Rav and Abai each are going to answer in different ways. Abai is going to bring two possible answers. Rav says, 
He doesn't really give us as an answer, but he says one can infer from here that Shmuel is right about something else. He said something that we've seen before. Shmamina ita l'dishmuel. So from here you can infer that Shmuel must be right because, and you'll see why in a minute. If you sell a promissory note, like this woman sold her ketubah, or a man is owed money, or a woman is owed money, and they sell the promissory note to someone else. Okay, so basically, let's say, okay, Reuven owes Shimon money, and Shimon sells his promissory note that Reuven owes him money to Rachel. So right now, Rachel has a document that says Reuven owes money to Shimon, Okay. So she basically, theoretically, can collect the loan of Ruvain to Shimon. But if Shimon wants to, and this is a crazy thing, but we've learned it before, so after Shimon sells this promissory note to Rachel, he then, then he says to Ruvain, you know, you owe me this money. Shimon says to Ruvain, you don't really need to pay it back to me. No, you don't need to pay it back at all. Okay, I'm canceling the loan. Even though, it's weird that Shimon could do this because Shimon sold the rights to somebody else. But Shmuel says, look, he has the right to do it. It might be deceptive and, and wrong and all that. But technically speaking, he can always cancel the loan since what Rachel has in her hands is not that Reuven owes Rachel money. It's that Reuven owes Shimon money. And Shimon at any point in any loan can always just say, oh, you don't have to pay me back. So even if Shimon sold the rights of that promissory note, they can always cancel it. But feel Yorish Mochel. Even the Yoresh of Shimon, even if Shimon's dead, his Yoresh can cancel it, even if it was sold to somebody else. What does that have to do with our topic? Well, comes Rabbi and says, why are we not worried that this husband will go back? You know, let's say the husband and wife want to retrieve the stuff, the ketuba that she sold to these guys or whoever she sold it to. So there's a much easier way to do it. You don't have to start pulling out a shovar with an earlier date and trying to do this. All she has to do is say to the husband, you don't have to pay me my ketubah. And she can be mochel on the loan. And then whatever she, right, if she sold the rights to somebody else, well, they have no rights to collect it ever because they'll say, oh, there is no ketubah, sorry. So now you understand also why we said that when you sell a promissory note, you have to sell it for a lot less money than it actually says in the promissory note. Because besides that maybe the person will never pay it back, now we see that it can actually be canceled entirely. So it's a dangerous business to go into that. So that's what Rabbi says, and that's his that's his explanation. Obviously, now everyone agreed with Shmuel about this. So if that makes you feel better anyway. So Abayah says, listen, even if you don't accept Shmuel, what's the case? The case is, now what's our concern? That the woman sold her ketuba. What happens if she sells her ketuba? She doesn't have the piece of paper anymore, right? She gives that piece of paper of the ketuba to somebody else. Well, Abai says, maybe what this is talking about is only in a case, this Braita that says, we'll give it back to the man, the, the, the shovar, this proof of, of payment, as long as the woman produces her ketuba and proves to us that she didn't sell it to anybody else. Because remember, this is all just, maybe she sold it to somebody else. So if she pulls out her ketuba, then we'll know that she didn't sell to anyone else, and then we'll allow this to happen. So this is what we call an ukimta, because he says the b'rita is only in a case where she actually pulls out a ketuba. The b'rita is not true across the board. We're only going to return it if she can show us her ketuba. Rava doesn't like that answer. Rava says, Rava Amari, you mishum shark ketuba, cheshin on the ketuba. A woman can have two ketubas. Ever hear of such a thing? Not because she has two husbands. But a woman can have two ketubas. Why? Could be that she lost the first one and then got a second one. She sells the second one and then finds the first one. So she could produce a ketuba claiming, oh, look, I didn't sell it to anybody, but maybe she did. And maybe this is a lost ketuba that was found. So Rava doesn't accept that opinion of Abai, that answer of Abai. But Abai has two things to say to Rav. One is to reject Rava's claim and basically say, I don't agree with you because Abai Amar, the first thing I have to say to you, Rabbi, is we are not worried about somebody having two ketubas. That's quite uncommon. We don't worry about that. You might remember that we all saw us to get about two ketubas not so long ago, and we said that also there's a reason also not to be worried about two ketubas, because some people say if you lose your ketuba, you don't need to write a new one, because remember, it's a it's a, it's a a tanai beitin, 
and the Beitim will give her a ketubah money anyway, and you don't rewrite the ketubah. So, could be for that reason we're not worried, but in any case, we're not worried about it. Ve'od, and now he's going to give another reason, which doesn't mean we have to do in kimta, meaning the bride could be across the board, and he gives a different reason. Ve'od shovar bizmano tarif. If the shovar says the tuba was paid in Nisan, even if it wasn't only paid till Tishrei, we go by the date in the shovar. And this you might remember, we discussed this already a bunch of times since we started this, this whole section. If you remember, Abaye's whole approach is once the witnesses sign, obviously we're talking about a shovar with signatures, otherwise it's a useless document. So if the receipt had signatures on it, then it doesn't matter when the husband actually gave her her tuba money. It's as if he gave her the tuba money on that date. And therefore, if she did go to collect from people she sold it to later, she'd actually be doing the right thing. It's true. She didn't have the rights to sell it. So she was wrong in selling it, but she could demand it back from them because she was wrong for selling it. Because really, once you write the shovar and the signatures, right, and the adim sign, according to Abai anyway, this is Abai's approach, that means it's valid from that day. Even if he actually didn't pay her yet. Okay, now that was the last section of that last Mishnah, which was discussing all sorts of situations where we find lost documents that we don't return because we're worried maybe they never actually decided to give it. And then you could have all sorts of problems with dates, with buyers and all that. Now we're going to go to the parallel mission, which lists all the kinds of documents. And this is the last mission of the chapter. Tomorrow, Bez Rat Hashem, we're going to finish the first chapter and start Elam Metzio. We'll be done with all this document complication, uh, complicated sugyot, although today you'll already see is easier partly because we have some of the, the issues down pat, and it's also just a bit of a simpler doc. Matzah igrot shum. So now we're going to have all these kinds of documents you find on the street that don't have these monetary problematic ramifications, and therefore we can just return it to whoever it, is, whoever it belongs to. So what would this be? Matzah igrot shum. Shum comes from the language of shuma. Shuma is an assessment. So if you have documents of assessment, this is when, let's say, there's a creditor who's owed money by a debtor, and the debtor didn't pay, and they go to take the property of the creditor of the debtor, the love. So what happens? They go to assess the land, and they say, this piece of land is assessed at X amount of money, and therefore the malve, the, the creditor, can seize that property. So it's just a document that says how much the land is worth. So that doesn't have... Right. Any problem, if we find it on the street, it's not. there's no concern of anything that could be wrong by returning it. Igrot mazon, that's when the husband commits, a uh, husband marries a woman who already has a child from a previous marriage, a daughter, and the husband commits to support the daughter. In other words, the wife asks, I'm happy to marry you, but please can you agree to support my daughter? So that's an igrot mazon, where he commits to support the daughter. So again, what's he going to do with that, right? It's not like there's any problem with the dates or anything else. Or maybe it wasn't ever given, right? There's no assumption that that was the case. Okay, this for sure has no ramifications. You notice, by the way, and we'll come back to this later, that we've, we're moving right now from the world of mamonot, of monetary agreements, to iser veheter, right? Which is marriage documents. So a woman does a chalitza, which is when her husband dies with, and they have no children. She has to do chalitza or yibum, right? Marry the brother, or the brother does chalitza with her. Until that point, she can't marry anybody else. So the chalitza document basically is a document that after they do the chalitza ceremony, she has a document that says, this woman did chalitza. So when she goes to get married, she brings it to the court. So if we find that on the street, we don't think, oh, maybe the chalitza wasn't done, right? We give it to her. Miunin. You might remember miun. We learned a lot about that in, in Seder Nashim about uh, a father can betroth a minor daughter and she's betrothed by Torah law. But if there's no father, then the mother or the brother can betroth her, but only by rabbinic law. And therefore, in that in the event that they did that, she can refuse the marriage. She gets a little older, right? When she's around the age of 12, she could say, I'm not interested in being married to this man. And she walks out. She doesn't need to get, she doesn't need anything. What she does need is a, is a document that they're going to write after she says, I refuse to be with this man. And then they write her a document that basically says she's not married. Sharei Beirurin, we don't yet know what that is. We'll wait till the Gemara to clarify. Bechol ma'aseh beitin, hareza yachzir. What's a ma'aseh beitin? Different opinions about it, but it's basically something that the court verified 
or perhaps an adrachta or a chaltata that we saw before, some sort of court-administered document or court-approved document. Matzav hachatisau b'deluskanah. And now we say, what if you find documents like, now we're back to Sharkov, and we find a, an IOU, but it's in something. Okay, we'll talk about in the Gemara, we'll see what they say, Chapisaz, we'll see what they say, Dluskema is. This is going to be a good example of the Mishnah using all this terminology that the, the Emoraim were unfamiliar with, both because they lived later and also they lived in a different country, right, in Babylonia rather than Israel. And then they start asking, what are all these terms? Okay. This also, by the way, you see the the I assume the Luskama is from the Greek, right? The effect, the the influences of the Greek language on on the people living in Israel, right? That they use Greek words all the time in their in their text. Okay. This also we're not going to yet know exactly what it is, but some sort of bundle of documents, as opposed to just one random document, they're bundled together. Once they're bundled together, that already could be. You can get it back by giving what we call simani. My, you say there's identifying features in this. I know mine look like this. And then, oh, then it must be yours. It must have fallen from you because you can give identifying marks about it. Kama agudah How much is that? Shalosha shurin zebazeh. Three tied to each other. Okay, we'll talk about this when we get to the Gemara more. Rashbag Rashbag adds a bunch more cases in our mission. Okay, now we have a situation where there's three documents, three IOUs. Either the Lovez name is the same in all three, but the borrower, but the lenders are different, or the reverse. The one who lent the money is the same in all three, and the people who borrowed the money is different. So the assumption is if three of them have the same name of the same Malve or the same Lovez, it must be theirs. Because what would they be doing, right? What would uh, Malve be doing with an IOU, in other words, again, one of them is an IOU that someone owes him money, but the other is that that same person owes money to someone else, and that same person owes money to a third person. So it's unlikely this Malve will be holding documents that are IOUs of other people. So if they all three have the Lovez name, and then we're going to return to the Lovez, and the reverse, if they all three say the Malve. Matzah, shtar ben shtarota. Ve'eni yodea mativo. This is, I find within my documents an IOU that Naomi owes Ruth money. Okay? Now, one of them, right, either Naomi gave it to me because Naomi already paid the money and wants me to keep it as proof. She's worried it's going to get lost in her house. So she gives it to me as proof that the loan was paid already. Or Ruth, who's owed the money, gave it to me because she wants... She wants proof that she hasn't gotten her loan back yet. Or there could be a third possibility, which is actually a possibility that's the most likely, is that part of it was paid back. And that's why they didn't want to leave Ruth with the document because then she'd collect the whole thing. But they couldn't rip up the document because then she'd pay part, right? And, and they basically said, listen, Michelle, you keep this and you remember that Naomi, that Ruth paid, uh, uh, it was Naomi paid half the loan, whatever it is, okay? So, but what happened? I don't remember what this is doing here. I have no recollection. Which one gave it to me, which would mean either it was paid or it wasn't paid, or was it partially paid? I don't know. What do we do with this? We have to leave this till Eliyahu comes, which either means, right, Eliyahu will clarify all, he's known as the person who will clarify all the unclear, anything that's unclear, or what it really means is until someone brings proof what exactly the scenario is. So we leave it until we have further proof. If there's receipts, even if the receipt is in the wrong person's hand, remember who's supposed to keep the receipt? The borrower that they pay back. But if you find it with the creditor, we still go by what the receipt says. Okay, so if it says that the LOVA paid the money back, even if you find it by the creditor, we give it back to the we assume the loan was paid back, even though that's not really where it belongs. We just assume that the Malva didn't give it yet to the Lova, and he should have. Okay, we'll get back to that. That will be our last studio for today, where we'll see Rav says something very different than this mission, and then we have to figure that out. My So we're going to first start with defining certain things. What does a Shtar Beiru mean? Hachatir Gemusa, it's interesting, because here means in Babylonia. 
as opposed to Rabbi Yirmiyah is the second one who's going to be in Eretz Israel. So you could see why different people translated this differently based on their reality, based on what they thought this term meant. So Hakatirgumu Shareta Anata. Shareta Anata are claims each side made in court. So it seems, at least I read about this, it seems a little strange to say this, but that until such point that you write down your claims, you could really be changing your claims a little bit. But once you write the claims down, in other words, this is they would record each person's claim in the court. Once it was written down, that was your definitive claim. And there was a star that came out that said, this is his claim, this is her claim. And then you would have these all written down. So that's star ta'anata. So you could see that doesn't really have monetary ramifications. Who we give it to, right? It's just informational. Rabbi Yirmiyam, our zebaweer lo'achav, a zebaweer lo'achav. This Shtarei Beruin has to do with Herak called Zeborer, the third chapter in Sanhedrin, which is all about how they would choose judges. And they would say the way they would choose judges, we'll get to it when we get to Sanhedrin, whether this was always or whether this was unique courts that were arbitration courts. And one side would choose one judge, the other side would choose the other judge. And then together they would choose the third, either the people together or maybe the two judges together. But the star would be basically recording which judge each side wanted. So again, it falls on the ground and you return it to whatever. It doesn't really make a difference who you return it to. So now we're going to deal with this case, but we're going to deal with it not head on. We're going to start with the story that we actually saw just about, I think, two dapim ago. There was a get that was found in the Beit Din of Rafuna. So there was a get that said, this person gave a get to this woman in the city of Shvire that was on the Rachis Nara. I'm a Rafuna. And Rav Huna says, turning out on the bet, you might remember we had a debate whether he said this or whether he asked it as a question. We're worried that maybe there's another city with the exact same name, which is quite rare, hard to imagine. And the same, there's the same people there. And basically we're worried that this isn't your get. And he wouldn't let the get go through, at least according to that opinion. That reads it as a statement, not as a question. Even if it's a question, he wouldn't really let the get, get th go through if he had a question. I'm going to let Rav Chista le Rabbe. So Rav Chista says to Rabbi, they're both students of Rav Huna. Huk ayin de orta baile Rav Huna mina. Go look into this because Rav Huna is going to ask you later, you know, like either quiz you up on it or or maybe because he really didn't know the answer. Nafik dak bashka. So he went and did his research and he found our Mishnah. And he said, oh, you can learn it from our Mishnah. Dits nan. Koma sebetina reze yachzil. And what are we not worried about? We're not worried if the court authorized this document. We're not worried. Maybe it was authorized for someone else. Maybe there's another person with that same name. So what do you see? See, it's not a problem. So, right, if we're worried that there's maybe it wasn't you, it was somebody else, just like we're worried with the get, then it, it would be a problem. So he basically goes against Rav Huna. Now we get to an interesting uh, confrontation. In the Beit Midrash, this part we didn't see when we saw the story the other day. He says, how on earth did you just do that? He said, you're comparing apples and oranges. You're learning for a case of get from a case of mamono. Get is Isur Vahater. You're going to allow this woman to go marry a man that perhaps she's really an Eshadish. Really, she's married because this get maybe isn't good. And you're going to learn halachot from monetary law? Monetary law and Yisra are two totally different things. We've seen this many times. We differentiate a lot between them. So he says, how on earth could you bring a proof from our Mishnah, which is all about mamono? To which Rabba responds, Amale, tarada, you fool. Okay, really, you know, you feel like they're going to punch each other. What do you mean our Mishnah is all about mamono? Now, it's true the case he quoted was mamono. Although not necessarily, because Masa Beitin could be any sort of court authorized document. And what does it say in our Mishnah? Shtare Chalitza, Shtare Miun. That's not Mamanot. Now, it's true he wasn't proving it from there, but he's basically saying you can't say that Mishnah is all about Mamanot. That Mishnah mixes the two. So, yeah, I can mix the two. I can learn from one to the other. Like we're talking about documents. The laws of documents apply across the board. Well, let's see what happens in the story. Haka Arza de Beirab. Immediately, a, a reaction in the Beit Midrash happened, and it wasn't a reaction by the people. It was a beam, a, a beam made of wood, of an Eitz Erez, a cedar tree, which is very strong, it's like burst, you know, and, and fell down in the middle of the Beit Midrash. Okay? 
So it sounds like the Tanur Shalachnai story, right? The famous story that actually is in Bava Metziah. We're going to get there in about a month from now, where certain actions that seem to be natural actions start happening to try to indicate something. And this was obviously trying to indicate that there's a problem with the Beit Midrash if you guys are talking to each other like that, right? This is not the way you speak of the Beit Midrash. And Mar Amar Mishum Latai Didi Paka, Umar Amar Mishum Latai Didi Paka. Each one said, it's on account of what you did to me that it happened. And the other one said, it's on account of what you did to me that it happened. Each one blaming the other, which obviously didn't make it any better. They didn't really learn their lesson. You know, everybody loves to point fingers. So all you have to do is open the news to see that, right? And everybody loves to say, it's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. And nobody assumes responsibility. So we got totally off topic here into, you know, the way things should be in the Beit Midrash and the way things should be in the world in general and the way people should respect each other and speak respectfully and not you know put each other down you can you can argue but there's a way to argue in an appropriate manner okay now we're going to start with all our explanations my chafisa what is a chafisa this was a type of flask that they would drink wine in a leather flask that they would take with them for wine so they put somehow the 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 um the shtarot, the documents in this flask. And then you could claim, oh yeah, there were documents in a flask. That's pretty rare. And then you could get it back. My dluskama, I'm a rabba rabba shmuel, tzlika de sabe. It's a box that elderly people put their stuff in. Elderly people often become forgetful, or can become forgetful. So they have their little items in a box so that they don't lose things, right? So thinking of like pills also, right? Um, so anyway, it's some sort of box that elderly people use if there's documents in a box like that. So again, you can, obviously this could be really just examples of any kind of unique way that your documents were in the public domain that you could claim, oh yeah, this was mine. They're bundled together. Uh, sorry. So we're now in a bright, I'm going to skip those words. What's a tachrich of shtarot? It's three shtarot that are kruchim zebaze. This is when you define a word using the same word. Didn't really help, right? Tachrich and kruchim are the same. Okay, they're they're wrapped together. Okay, three are tied together. Okay, so one is that they're rolled together and one is that they're tied together. So now they say, wait, if they're tied together, shma mina kesher siman, can you infer from here that how it's tied as a siman, like you could tell me, it was tied with a, a loop knot. It was tied with a this knot. And that's like a bit of a question, whether a kesher is a siman. We're actually going to get to that later in the Masechet. Uh, I'm pretty sure from what I remember, it makes sense. Also, it'll be in the next chapter about finding lost items and what are simanim, about whether a kesher is a siman or not. So it seems a little weird to which they say, Hatani Rabbi Chia, Shlosha Kruchin Zebazen. And they say, in fact, Rabbi Chia explains, Agudot doesn't mean they were tied. It means they were kruchim, they were bound together or wrapped together. So they say, wait a minute. Then you have tachrich of shtarot is shlosha kruchim and agudash of shtarot is shlosha kruchim. That means they're both the exact same thing. And the Mishnah listed these as two separate cases. You can see how they're struggling to define this. And that's what the Gemara asks. Ihachi hainu tachrich. Well, if they're both kruchim, then they're the same. It's the same exact thing and they're not two separate cases and the Mishnah lists them as two. To which they say, tachrich, Okay, tachrich is when you wrap them. I'll show you with papers. Where you wrap them. Sorry, I just took some messy papers on my desk. And you put one, and then you, a little further down, you put the next one, and then further down, you put the next, and then you roll them up like that, okay? It's a little bit like a scroll, but not exactly like a scroll, because a scroll would be one after the other. This seems like they're intertwined, but not lined up. And the agudim would be, let's read it inside, you line them all up so that they all start and end in the same place, and then you roll them up. Okay, that would be more. That would be agudot. Okay, where you they start and finish in the same place. So then we have two different ways. Now the Gemara wants to ask, my um aguda de ramu ada right? Okay, ramu ada my makris. So now I want to know. The Gemara wants to know, if I find these documents on the ground and they're bundled up, what do I announce? I go and I announce, I found three shtarot and you have to tell me how they were bound or I found 
bound Sharon and you have to tell me how many, like what exactly details do I tell you? So Minyan, they say, if you say Minyan, if you say, I say that I found three documents, my Iriatlata, Filutre Nami, why does the Mishnah say three? If I already tell you how many, it could be two, it could be three, it could be four, it could be five, it could be six, it doesn't make a difference. Why does it have to be at least three? So they say it must be Elikid Amar Ravina. It must be you don't announce how many. And it's like Ravina said in a different case, Tiva Machris, when you find coins, what do you say? Like coins, if you find coins in a particular way, you can announce them because people can give a siman. So what do you announce? How many coins you found? And people have to say how you found them. Um, no, you announce coins. I found coins. And then people have to say how many and in what formation were they? Likewise here, Hachanami Shtare Machris. You say, I found documents. And then the person who finds that, who, who that were lost from has to say how many and how they were bound. And then you were wrapped, however you call it. And then that explains the two, three. Why does that explain the two, three? Because it can't be two. Because if I say I found documents, what does documents mean? We've seen this many times in the Gemara. They assume when you use plural, you mean two. So you basically already said, I found two documents. So when they say, yeah, I lost two documents and they were bound like this, that won't help you because they're basically not giving you a number that you didn't already say yourself. So it has to be more than that where they start identifying how many plural documents, either three or four or five or six. Rashbag Omer. So now we're going to go through those two cases, first one and then the other, about possible issues that could be here. So if they all say that I have three dot. There were three documents on the ground that said I borrowed money from Jack and Jane and and Paul. Okay, three names. So now, if they all have my name on it, we return to me. If they belong to those three people, what were they doing? What were they doing together? It makes no sense. Maybe the three of them sent a messenger to the court to validate the documents. Maybe that's why. There were three Malvids who got together, sent the same shaliach to bring their stuff to the court. So it could be there's a reason why they're all three together. Dilma, so they say Dimakaimi. No, it would have to be then to make sure that that wasn't the case. We're only talking about, I can only get them back if they were already validated by the court. Because then you're right, it could be they were on the way to the court. Dilma miyada de Safranafil, maybe they fell from the hands of the Sofer. And that's why he has three documents, right? And then maybe they were never given yet. Maybe there was no loan yet. Um, or or maybe the Sofer had this stuff from the Malve or something. So they say no. Loma Shi'inish Kiyume Biyada de Safra. Nobody puts documents that are already validated. When does the Sofer have them? At the early stage, before they're written. Once they're written, once they get validated by the court, they don't go back to the Sofer. So it makes no sense. So basically, there is no real other option, and that's why I get to keep them. Now we're going to do the same thing with the reverse case. So if I was the one who lent the money, and my name was in all three, but I lent the money to three different people, we assume they're mine. So again, if it belonged to the people who borrowed the money, what would they be doing here? To which the Gemara says, wait, Dilma Asli. Maybe they went to write them. Okay, maybe, remember, the Lova is the one in charge of writing the documents. So maybe the Lova went to write the documents, but really there was no loan yet, okay? Or the, the, they went to be written, right? And then maybe they're, they just got finished writing at the sofa. So why did they give them back to me? So they say, just one second, I want to check one thing. Um... Right, and then it would just show that there was no loan at all. So then they say, Each one is written by a different sofa. You could tell by the handwriting. Right? Everybody's handwriting is different. So then you know that they didn't fall from the sofa because there are different handwritings. Maybe there, I was taking them to get to do Kim Shtar. And maybe that's why. And then maybe it wouldn't show that, right, then it would show, what would it show? The loan happened. We were taking it to court to get validated. But, and I didn't, but it didn't show that I paid the money back. If I get to keep the documents, it showed I paid the money back. And then I don't have to pay the money. If it was on the way to the court to get validated, and maybe, you know, I, maybe I sent them with a messenger or I brought them myself and they fell 
on the way the court to get validated, I mean, I'd owe the money. So why aren't we worried about that possibility? So they say, again, it's not my responsibility. It's all about who's responsible for what, right? It's not my responsibility as the Lova to go get it validated in the court. I prefer not be validated. It's the Malva's job. So if it fell from anyone, it would be from the Malva. And again, the problem is there's three different creditors here, three different people who loan money. It wouldn't be all together. So it's unlikely that's the case. And therefore, I get it back. Last so good for today. If there's a receipt, remember, there's a receipt. Even if we find the receipt in the Malva's property, we give it to the Lova. Okay, even though it's not really where it belongs. We assume what? We assume the loan was paid back. Because why else would Malva write the shovar, the receipt? And the Malva just said, oh yeah, I'll give it to you tomorrow and never gave it. So now, I'm a Rav Yirmiya Bar Abba, I'm a Rav. Rav Yirmiya Bar Abba says in the name of Rav, Simpon Ayotse Mitache Yidei Malve. It sounds like the exact same thing. You find a Simpon in the hands of the Malve. Even if it's written, in his own hands, handwriting. This is not a valid document at all. It's like he's playing. Okay, we'll see what that means in a minute. But we're not even talking, like not only if it was written by a sofer. Now we're going to start thinking, talking about what possibility could be that the Malva has this shofar. And there's no indication from the fact that he has this. We don't assume that the loan was paid back. Why would the Malva have a shovar if the Lova, okay, this, by the way, goes totally against the Mishnah, and that's what we're going to have to deal with. So if you're thinking, what do you mean? Isn't this the exact opposite of the Mishnah? It's the exact opposite of the Mishnah. Our Mishnah said if we find a sh uh, um, shovar, a Kabbalah, this Simpon, at the Malva's property, we assume it was already written because the loan was given back and we give it to the Lova. But Rav Yirmiya says in the name of Rav, we do not give it back. Not if it's written in his own handwriting, not if it's written in the Sofer's handwriting. Now, what's the difference and why neither, though? Well, if it was written in Taviyad Sofer, you might think, you might say, Safra Itramale Uchtab. Think about the Malva's position. The Malva wants to get his loan back. That's his job, right? He wants to make sure he gets paid. So, what does he do? He knows that you're not going to, let's say it's me and you. I know you're not going to give me the money back unless you have a receipt in hand, unless, right, you're not smart. But if you're smart, you're going to say, I'll pay you back, Michelle, but give me a receipt in hand. So if I'm going to get my loan back and I want to get it back and I bump into a sofair, right, because I don't know how to write myself. Well, I might bump into that sofair and say, oh, you're free now. Great. Write me this shovar right now, even though I don't know the love is going to pay me back. But that way, when I see the love, I'll say, here's a shovar. So that would be taviyad sofair because it's not in my control to be able to write this document. So it might be, I'll get it written earlier. And that's what it means here. The Memar Safra Itramale, it could be I bumped into a Sofer, Uchatav, and he wrote it for me. But even if it's in my own handwriting, we assume the same thing. Because Saval, Dilma Mitrame Ba'ate Benashmasha, maybe I'll bump into the, the Love, Benashmasha, right as Shabbat is about to start. And Kaparali, and he'll pay me back. And if I don't give him the Kabbalah right then, the Shoval, he's not going to give me my money back. So what will I do? I'll write it now. And then it'll be ready. In other words, it's very likely the Malva wrote this document in advance. There's no guarantee that he was able to actually get, and again, again because the Malva is the one who writes the Shovar, it's possible it was written before it was paid back and it was never really paid back. It's also not in his hands to do the paying back. So that's Rav, quoted by Rav Yirmiya Bar Abba, and now we have a big problem because Tashma, what about our Mishnah? Nimtza lecha ben, uh, sorry, Tanan, I, I skipped up two lines, Tanan. Im yeshimahem simpono, yase masha besimpono. What do you see in our Mishnah? It says, you do exactly what it says in the simpon, you give the simpon back. You assume, even if we find it but with the Malva's documents, we give it back to the Lovet. And Rav said the exact opposite. We don't. We assume that maybe he wrote it and never actually got his money back. Wrote it in preparation, hoping to get his money back. So they say, Kid Amar of Safra, like Rav Safra says, to resolve a different difficulty, which will be our difficulty number three today. So we'll see where Rav Safra actually says it. But just like he says it there, and he explains, 
Just like he says there, well, it depends where you find it. If you find it among ripped documents of the Malve, as if it's not important at all, then, okay, so just like he answers the question there, Hachanami will say the same thing here. The mission is talking about a kesham, it's the Oban Shtagotav Kuin. You found it with his, his, his garbage pile. If you find it in his garbage pile, then you can assume it's the Lovez, because he doesn't care about it at that point. But if you find it with his documents in his file cabinet, then you can assume that he was preparing to get his loan back and he never really got it back. So it really depends where you found it. And that's the way we're going to resolve the next two difficulties as well. We're going to bring two other Mishnayot, the first from Baba Batra, the second from Shvuot. And we're going to prove from there, again, bring a difficulty against Rav and then resolve it in the same way. Tashma, let's learn from here. Nimtzal echa ben shtarotav shtaro shel Yosef ben Shimon parua. So I lent to two people named Yosef and Shimon. And then you, I have a document in my property that says, a, a Kabbalah receipt that says, Shimon, Yosef and Shimon paid me back. But it doesn't say which Yosef and Shimon. Now, if we hold like Rav, what are we going to say? Well, it's in my hands, which means it's likely I never gave it. And we don't do anything about it. But this says, Not only do we assume that the Yosef and Shimon that paid it back, paid it back. Since we don't know which one, the burden of proof is on me. I have this document that said the Yosef and Shimon paid me back, which we assume means he did pay me back. It's just we don't know which one. So neither of them has to pay me back. So what do you see? The fact that the receipts of my property doesn't help me. We still give it to the Lova. In this case, we don't give it to anyone, but we assume it was paid. It's the same thing. So... Again, they say, just like Rav Safra said, just like he says elsewhere, which we're almost there, where he says it, we're going to say the same thing by us. It must be that this document of Yosef and Shimon was paid back, was found in the middle of my RIP documents. It was found with my RIP stuff, then we assume it belongs to Yosef and Shimon. If it was found with my good documents, then we go like Rav and we'd say, I, I never really got paid back yet. I was just preparing for the event, you know, for when that would happen. Tashma, third question against Rav Yirmiyah. In the end, there's going to be five questions against him. Again, Rav Yirmiyah in the name of Rav. Shvua shelo pakadu abba. So someone goes to, to, they go to collect a loan from their father and they say, we take an oath that our father never told us when he was on his deathbed that this loan was paid back already. Shalom Arlanu Abba, that he didn't tell us when he was healthy that this loan was paid back. Shalom Atsanu Ben Shtarotav Shal Abba Shishtar Zeparua. And when we looked through our father's documents, we didn't find a simpon, shoval, kabbalah, whatever you call it. We didn't find a receipt saying it was paid. Now, this seems to imply what? If we found a receipt in our father's documents that it was paid, then we would assume it was paid. And what did we say? According to Rav, Rav no. If you find it by the Malve, you can just assume that. He was getting ready to get paid, but not that it was paid back. But this seems to imply the opposite. And that's where Amar of Safra, Shenim Tzaben Shtarot, Shtarot Krui. Okay, again, this was only, we didn't find it within ripped documents of our fathers. And that would have indicated that actually it was paid back. Okay, we'll stop here for today. We'll finish up with the last two questions tomorrow. And with that, we'll start the second chapter. So quick review of today's stuff. We started with the Shovar. We ended with the Shovar. The first Shovar was the one of the Ketubah. And why aren't we worried about monkey business there? We had two answers of Abai and one of Rava. Then we went to the list in the Mishnah of all these documents that you actually can return, either because there's no financial ramifications or because there's a clear sign that it belonged to someone. And then what we basically ended up doing was clarifying what, like Shtar Be'erim, we didn't know what that was. And then we had that case of Rav Huna again with the, with the Shne Shviri, and we used our Mishnah there, right? That's just brought in because one line in our Mishnah was used to question what Rav Huna said, and then we got into this whole fight that we didn't see last time of the beam and the, the pillar in the Beit Midrash, uh, the Beit Midrash breaking because of the inner fighting between the rabbis and the disrespect between between them. Then we clarified what's Chasifa, what's Luskama, how these Shtarot were bundled together, what would be an indicator, how you would announce it, what the person would have to bring, what Simanim they would have to say. That's really, by the way, like a getting ready to get into the next chapter, which is all about returning lost items. And then um, the three belonging to the Lova, the three, the Malve, they, they raise, maybe there is concern that it's someone else's, but they reject all those possibilities. And then we ended up with this statement of Rav that seems to go contrast 100% with our Mishnah. And then we had to resolve 
How do we how do we resolve it? And then it says, well, it really depends where you found the receipt. Where within the Malva's property was it? Was it with his junk or was it with his in his file cabinet? Okay. And then that would affect whether it was his that he was saving to give when he got paid back and then the loan isn't paid back. Or was it really he just was lazy, never gave it to the Lova, and the Lova never demanded it, but really it was already paid back. Okay. And then we had how to resolve the three contradictory Mishnayot that seemed to go against Rav. That will end for today. Wishing everybody a good day.